Good evening and welcome to our second edition this season of Duke Reads. This evening I'm very happy to have with me Judith Ruderman, a Duke PhD who is currently Vice Provost for Academic and Administrative Services at Duke and an adjunct professor of English. Now we're going to talk about E.M. Forrester's book Howard's End. D.H. Lawrence is Judith's specialty and she is a longtime member of the editorial board of the D.H. Lawrence Review was the first female president of the D.H. Lawrence Society of North America. In 1981, with funding from the North Carolina Humanities Center, she devised and directed a series of free public programs for the Durham County Library, and it was called Many Faces of Bloomsbury. The series, which included scholars from Duke, UNC Chapel Hill, NC State, and UNC Greensboro, consisted of lectures, film showings, and a photo exhibit and she says she is delighted 27 years later to revisit her favorite book, Howard's End. This evening's session is part of Duke's year-long programming of the Bloomsbury Group. Uh, it's an exhibit, there will be an exhibit at the Nasher Museum of Art and showcase some of their art and that exhibit opens December 18th. So now, Howard's End, Judith Ruderman. My first question as always, why? Why did you choose this book? Well, my um, choices were limited in that I was asked to pick a book that would work well with the upcoming exhibit of Bloomsbury Art at the Nasher. Mm. So that narrowed the field somewhat for me. I was asked to do this session with you, Frank, uh, without anybody's knowledge or remembrance that I had had some connection to Bloomsbury in the Durham County Library all those years ago. But for me, it was a natural reconnection. So the question is, why did I choose this book? when I could have chosen a variety of books that would be called Bloomsbury, sure. if you will. So what I did was first go to my bookshelf, and the first thing I pulled off was Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Mm -hmm. And I started to read it. I'd read it before, and I had liked it before. But maybe I was cranky that evening. Maybe I was <laughs> tired. Maybe I was a little bit lazy. But I felt I didn't, I didn't feel like giving it the energy that it deserved because its, um, it's technique is, is difficult and you, you, have to, you have to be where Virginia Woolf is in terms of the technique. So I went back to the bookshelf. This time I took off um, Room with a View mm -hmm. by E.M. Forster, mm -hmm. which I had remembered as being a charming book. I started to read a Room with a View and whereas I'd once thought of it as charming, I must tell you frankly, I thought of it as a little silly. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe I wasn't in the right place, if you will. So the next book next to um, that one was Howard's End. And then I remembered how much I had loved mm -hmm. Howard's End. I went and I reread it. I immediately loved it. Who would not be drawn immediately into a novel that begins, one might as well start with Helen's letters to her <laughs> sister. Um, and I, I think I want to refer to E.M. Forster's aspects of the novel. These are lectures he gave in Cambridge, at Cambridge in 1927, when he says, the final test of a novel will be our affection for it, as it is the test of our friends and of anything else which we cannot define. And the bottom line is, I have great affection mm -hmm. for Howard's End. Well, let me push this a little farther, because it's also a question <laughs> uh, in, in that passage and in what you just said of, readability. You talked about the energy that you might have to apply to Virginia Woolf. These are all considered modern writers mm -hmm. and I, I think there's a line in the introduction, uh, isn't there, that, that says something like, you know, he's irritatingly uh, not great. And, and that seems to be a reference to his readability as though there's something deficient about that. Is it kind of a defect? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure that I recall that David Lodge was making a point about his readability, but I will, since you said these are all modern writers, I will say something about, about his readability and why he is more readable at first blush, if you will, than somebody like James Joyce mm -hmm. or Virginia Woolf or even D.H. Lawrence. When we think of modernist writers, we often think of, for instance, stream of consciousness. We think of certain techniques that define somebody as a modernist writer. Well, we don't have stream of consciousness in this. If we pick up um, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner, and we're immediately in the mind of, of Benji, who's mentally retarded, um, it's, we have to piece things together. Right. Um, this book isn't like that. 
one might as well start with Helen's letters to her sister, and there's nothing arcane or difficult about a letter to your sister. I must say, though, that he is deceptively simple because For Forster weaves into that letter, letter many of the motifs mm -hmm. and themes that will reoccur through the novel. So this is not, this is not a simple letter to one's sister novel. So I, I should say that, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But another thing about its readability, you wanted to say something, but I'm jumping in. I want you to keep going. Um, uh, discontinuous narrative we think of sometimes when we think about a modernist novel where a time is a bit out of skew. We don't have that with this novel. Mm -hmm. It reads from first to last, and the only discontinuity, discontinuity of it is that the first 100 pages take place over a very small period of time. Then we skip two years, and we skip, then at, by the end of the book, it's four years from the beginning. That's it. So it is, it's very linear in that sense, although in other senses it's not. Um, I'm not sure th that a great novel can't be readable, but you may, you may be on to something that um, in, our, in, in terms of modernist literature, uh, a technique that is difficult um, and requires a great deal from the reader might make some people think that qualifies more for greatness. Yeah, and, and it's an interesting point because those other writers, that technique that you talked about was deliberate and, and a kind of rebellion against what they had considered the novel. Forrester apparently, and, and you tell me, just didn't feel the need to, to, to be a rebel. He just wanted to write a good book. Well, and, and the irony of all that is that he could never really publish on the subject that most interested in him, him which was not heterosexual relationships. Right. So many years later, looking back in 1958 to Howard's end, he said, you know, uh, I, the one thing I could, the one thing that it bores me, all these <laughs> swishing of skirts and so forth. So um, that, that's kind of interesting and ironic. But he didn't feel that he had to have some kind of unreliable narrator. His narrator is totally reliable. And if we don't believe that, if we, if we look for something else from this novel, then we're going to lose a lot. We kind of, and in fact, Forster consistently draws our attention to the fact that we are reading uh, a novel. In, in that sense, it almost seems like postmodernism mm -hmm. when, when so many you know, that, that's a bit of, I think David Lodge may make that point too, but we, we do believe in the narrator and what he's telling us. We do. Now, he does play tricks with that, with that narrator's voice, with the, the omniscient voice. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to intrude in a way that sometimes is over and above the well, narrator's role, telling me too much. Well, that, that's a good point, and maybe that's why Lionel Trilling, who I think was the first one who said that this novel is not great, mm -hmm. 1943, a landmark study of E.M. Forster, uh, Forster, you know, didn't die till 1970, so he yeah. lived to a very ripe age, but never published another novel after 1924. But um, uh, what, was I, what was I saying? I think we were talking about the, the novel itself and his, the trick of the narrator. Oh, the trick of the narrator, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, the narrator gets very uh, portentous or pretentious, or that's if you're not reading him in the Forsterian mood. I, I always tell my students, you really have to meet an author more than halfway. And some authors, it's very difficult to do that, like D.H. Lawrence. Ian mm. e. Forster, it's easier, but um, people may think that he gets too preachy at times, because really, it's quite a didactic book. There are things he wants to teach us about <laughs> and tell us. And so sometimes the narrator just goes above the action, yeah. No, sometimes he goes into, our, into the characters' heads. Mm -hmm. uh, David Lodge calls, calls that something like free, indirect discourse or narration or something like that. So he'll go into this character's head and that character's head, some more than others. But um, every once in a while, he goes above and moralizes or generalizes. <laughs> right. and, and, uh, and David Lodge doesn't like that aspect yeah. of the book. And sometimes I don't either. And sometimes I just feel, well, it's fine with me because anything Forster wants to do with me with this book is just fine with me because I'm his friend, you see? It's like, you know, if you're my best friend and you do something, you say something I don't like, I forgive you. It. Yeah, You're my friend. <laughs> it's one of those quirky things that we learn to sort of incorporate in the writing. Yeah. Well, let's get to that and find out about you, a little more about your friend through the questions that we've uh, developed today, that you've developed. 
Um, let's take the first one. Are the aspects of England's condition in 1908 to 1910 resonant with 21st century United States? So it's interesting because if you read the Forster criticism, dating from way back, and remember how long ago this book was published, so we have many decades of Forster criticism. No matter what, no matter what era the, the critic is writing in, the critic will usually say, the book doesn't seem dated. Huh. You yeah. know, whether yeah. it's the, the 60s yeah. or the 80s or 2009. So in some ways, the book is in its period. There's, a, there's a, a brief remark about somebody who's laced too tightly, mm -hmm. okay? So we know this is when they're wearing corsets. And, and by the way, I think you, Frank, and all our listeners and readers must see the movie of Howard's End, because it's a fab, have you seen it? I have not. It's fabulous it's with Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins and Helena Bonham Carter. It's a Merchant and Ivory movie. And when you see it, you can almost understand how Margaret could fall in love with Henry, because that's a big issue yeah, people have yeah. with this novel. Um, but it does resonate with us today. I asked this question, which is a, perhaps too obvious a question, before the market collapsed, before the bailouts, before the abyss, a very Forsterian word, he didn't invent it because it was a word in great currency in 1908 to 1910 when people were analyzing the condition of England and the word abyss was used in several titles, not of fiction so much, but of nonfiction, uh, sociology, if you will. But um, now a lot of people today feel that they're not that far from the abyss. Now, that's a very grand word, abyss. So we may not feel we're actually hovering over the abyss, but some people do. I mean, you and I may be worried about what's happening with our resources, but right. other people, this is actually losing their home. Right. And what resonates with this novel more than the mortgage foreclosure issue of 2009? Because the whole thrust of the novel is about being homeless and looking right. to find a home. And, so. and, and your starting point, too, and the questions of class mm -hmm. uh, and privilege and education that run throughout this book and where, you know, where your starting point is. Again, wh what happens if you are, uh, what happens if you're Leonard Bast? I need my cheat notes. Yeah, they, Leonard Bast. these char characters keep raising their hand. Yeah. So if you're Leonard and you lose everything, you really, you're on the street. Now, if you're Margaret and you lose everything, you don't lose everything. You know? I mean, yeah. there's, there's, you, you have enough wealth, you have enough background so that you can go somewhere. Just to compare those two, they're in roughly the same condition. They're about to lose their place. But right. what that means to someone with privilege and what it means to someone without education and privilege is two entirely well, different things. And, and, and look at two related points. One is that where do we, what do we see of Leonard when, when, um, I, when Tibby goes to find Leonard to mm -hmm. actually insist that he take the money, he finds his possessions out on the street mm -hmm. and no Leonard. But when Helen, we're told in a brief little line, Forster is so good at these little lines, we're told that, well, she invested, she invested her money again and it made, you know, big bucks. That's not how he put it. Mm -hmm. So it seems in this book, the poor get poorer. And it's not that Helen and Margaret are rich, and it's not that Leonard's in the abyss. It's like he's a very low middle right. class and they're upper middle class, but there's a big, Difference. A huge difference. Helen can't imagine that anybody who would be in the in the house with her sister talking about books could possibly own this umbrella. I mean, it's, it's unimaginable. Well, that is a very sad line. One of Forster's throwaway lines. When Helen said, "When you know, they go, they follow her home, Margaret and." Leonard because she's taken his umbrella. Helen is careless. Yeah. In fact, a, there's a lot of carelessness in this novel. Mm -hmm. she's, a, she's a good person, but she's careless. And she takes his umbrella. That's just the material object of her representing her carelessness. But what does she, when he comes to get it and she's looking, oh, I always take everybody's umbrellas and she looks around. You know, it's like a, cu a cute mm. humorous scene. And what does she say? Oh, it can't be that mm. one. That's gone at the seams. And that's, and it is his. And it hurts. Right. She's careless. She doesn't think. Right. And, and frankly, to them, Margaret and Helen, he's interesting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the book 
maybe I'm making too much of this. I think the book makes a point about how we use other people, even unintentionally. Right. He's just plain old interesting right. to them. And in their set, interesting is a very um, high word, a very important adjective. But you know, he doesn't want to be interesting. He just wants culture. Which he thinks, I guess, I, I took it to mean that that would also invest him in this class that he that he wants so much to be a part of. Yes, I think I think yeah. you're right. But they recognize in him he has something even more than that. Yeah. That's what attracts them yeah. to him and him to them. To, to him, they represent culture. And to them, he represents the striving for yeah. something worthy, you know. Well, let's see what others have to say about this very question, how applicable today uh, this book is today. Uh, Manisha Desai has said, uh, I thought Dr. Ruderman was very prescient in choosing this novel, given that I was reading it during the last weeks of the presidential election with the issues of socialism and distribution of wealth being raised in this campaign. And as I said, I picked this book a long time before. Uh, well, I can't exactly remember exactly when I picked the book, <laughs> but I didn't pick it with the present situation in mind. Yeah. I picked it because it's a Bloomsbury book. But the sisters do belong to this conversation yeah. club, this discussion group, where they do have this conversation very animated right. about how we can help people who don't have money. And everybody has a different idea about how to do that. And I want to read Joanne's comment. She has written in uh, already about this question. And she says, in the modern dwelling place, um, oh, she's, she's uh, referring to page uh, 41, and she's quoting, it had to be, um, it had been too easily gained and could be relinquished too easily. Perhaps, she says, there's a similarity to the current mortgage and housing crisis. Again, now she refers to page 75. They thrilled with the excitement of death of a rapid death and stood in groups. The funeral of the rich person was to them the funeral of uh, uh, Al yeah, Alcestis yeah, and, 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 and Ophelia. We have to look in the notes. Uh, <laughs> is, to, is to the educated, similar uh, similarity to deaths of celebrities and important figures. Now they're identifying with the kind of the rich and the famous. But, you know, and getting back to this conversation about socialism and distribution of wealth, I mean, it was, it's, and I think the polls have borne it out, you know, in this campaign when John McCain talked about that, everybody over 60 got frightened at the notion of distribution of wealth, and everybody under 30 said, well, I don't have much of that, it sounds good to me. But in large part because they don't have the overlay and the memory of the, this discussion about the distribution of wealth and, and, and economic justice with the overlay of the geopolitical concern of mm -hmm. the Cold War. Absent that, it's a different discussion. For those of us who grew up in the Cold War, you couldn't talk about it in, in, in a way that didn't lead you to treason. You know? you know yes. Like, and yes. here, of course, they We're, can. Yes. And now again, we can. Even and that's what made this book, I thought, well, now we can have this discussion. Well, now that's one way a book is, could be called great. If a book seems not only readable, <laughs> we won't hold it against it, him that this yeah. book is readable, yeah, yeah. but also deals with important issues, right. not only of the day, but of the day with capitals. Forster loves to capitalize things when he wants us to. <laughs> Attention. Then that, that, that can maybe yeah. qualify as greatness. And it's pretty much the same discussion, whether or not wealth and privilege obliges you to some responsibility or whether you just need to keep it because that, that after all, is your responsibility. And, and, but let's look at it the other side, too. You know, it's very easy for us and natural for us to talk about the distribution of wealth and Margaret's feelings about that and Helen's, because Helen does want to give, mm -hmm. what, 5,000 pounds, I forget what it is, and Tibby blanches. <laughs> um, but also, there's a relationship here to Margaret's relationship to Henry and how the whole notion of business comes mm, right. into this novel. D.H. Lawrence, you mentioned that, you know, mm -hmm. D.H. Lawrence is, is, is my, my great, my first love. Right. Uh, he's my friend, a great friend, but Lawrence is my love. And um, Lawrence wrote to E.M. Forster about Howard's End, you know, you are wrong in glorifying that businessman business is no good. Mm. But a Forster recognizes 
that business is necessary <laughs> to keep the world going, to keep the economy going, and that's one of the beauties of Forster. This is one of the things I like, and it relates to the motto of the novel, Only Connect. Right. Okay. Um, Margaret is totally aware of Henry Wilcox's failings. And, and a terrible scene happens at the very, very, very end of the book when she learns that through all these hundreds of pages, as it were, he's kept the house from her. He, didn't, he did not honor his wife's personal appeal. And for Forster and for Bloomsbury, there's nothing more important than a personal appeal. But what, how is it phrased on the very last page of the book when Dolly, oh, we, should, we must talk about the flat and the round characters, when Dolly lets it slip that uh, Margaret got the house that was meant for her all along. Um, and, and her husband explains to her how, she got, how this happened. You know, my wife left it to you, but I set that paper aside, mm -hmm. little knowing what my Margaret would be to me in the future. Margaret was silent. Something shook her life in its inmost recesses, and she shivered. That's, that's at the very end of the book. There's, there's not a happy ending here. Mm -hmm. It seems like a happy ending. Um, Margaret is totally aware of his flaws, and he is very flawed. Uh, and it may be a weakness to some people of this novel that she got together with him in the first place. But she recognizes that we can't just say, we don't countenance business. Because right. she's about making connections. Which she's about making connections between the poetry and the prose, and Henry's nothing if he's not prose. <laughs> if he's not prosaic. Let's move on to the second question, uh, which is, Virginia Woolf considered the foremost exemplar of a modernist way of depicting character. Forrester is seen as a moralist, expressing himself if uh, through the novel of social commentary, and that's Walter Allen's comment. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a comment on Forrester as a modern writer. Mm -hmm. So, and I think we've, we've touched on this a little bit, his notion of, of wanting to talk directly. He's, got, he's on a mission. Well, times. Virginia Woolf criticized uh, Forrester they were friends. You know, Forster is often to be said to be of the Bloomsbury group, in the Bloomsbury group. Many people think of him more as kind of on the periphery, mm -hmm. coming in and out of the Bloomsbury group. She criticized him and he criticized her in essays about each other's works. And um, uh, Virginia Woolf, uh, com she criticized her friend E.M. Forster for sometimes being too much of the, she didn't put it this way, but too much of the tea table. Mm -hmm. Not enough uh, vision in her characters. Forster, for his part, in an essay of, I think, 1941, uh, said about her that um, sometimes her characters weren't all that mm. real. So each found in the other a deficiency that they saw as a strength in themselves. Well, let's get back to this notion of connection along those lines. For Forrester, it seems vital that these, obviously the, the characters have a connection. So they complete themselves in a way. They're not individuals. It is precisely how they're seen in relation to each other that completes the character. I mean, Henry seems much more prosaic standing across from Margaret, doesn't he? I mean, well, the problem is that he doesn't really relate. Yeah. And one of the interesting passages to me, I mean, many times we're told in this novel about personal appeals and personal relations and how obtuse he is. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you and I could probably talk for four hours about this book because it's so rich. But this issue, there's nothing more important than this issue of personal relations. Mm -hmm. um, where the, uh, the narrator dips into his head about his, re his feelings toward his wife. Listen to this now. This is on page 221, if others want to read along. His affection for his present wife grew steadily. Okay? Now, stead to see life steadily, we've already been told, is, wh is what he does. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see it whole. So Forster, each word that Forster chooses is very deliberate and resonates throughout the novel. Her cleverness gave him no trouble. Okay, And indeed, he liked to see her reading poetry or something about social questions. It distinguished her from the wives of other men. Okay, She has utility for him. She's what we might call a trophy wife. First of all, she's 20 years younger than he is. But also, those other wives, they're so boring. But his wife, 
she's distinguished, okay? He had only to call, and she clapped the book up and was ready to do what he wished. We're in his head now, mm -hmm. okay? Then they would argue so jollily, love that word, jollily, <laughs> and once or twice she had him in quite a tight corner, but as soon as he grew really serious, she gave in. Man is for war, woman for the rec recreation of the warrior. But he does not dislike it if she makes a show of fight. She cannot win in a real battle, having no muscles, only nerves. Nerves make her jump out of a moving motor car or refuse to be married fashionably. The warrior may well allow her to triumph on such occasions. Here's the thing. These are not what we would, what Forster would call personal relations. First of all, this isn't first of all, this is more like third of all. Mm -hmm. This business about women have nerves but no muscle and they jump out of moving cars or refuse to get married properly. The reader, of course, is not as obtuse as Henry Wilcox. We know precisely why she jumped out of that car. And by the way, she's going to jump out of a car again mm -hmm. later in the novel. Mm -hmm. She jumped out of the car because the car ran over a child's pet. Okay, they say, well, it was only a cat, you know, it wasn't a dog. I mean, there's a hierarchy here. But now she's called, she's, she's, she's said to have nerves. She's a, ner you know, yeah. women are like that. They're nervy. They jump out of cars. Why does she refuse to be married um, fashionably? Because there's, there's, uh, she can't, just can't do it after that fiasco of, of, a, uh, of, a, of a wedding that was Evie's where Jackie comes mm -hmm. and uh, all of this comes to light, how can she put on a show, you know, for his friends? Friends he doesn't even like, by the way, we're told, that he made wise investments in money, but he didn't invest well in his friends. So the man has not really no conception of personal relations. And it shows up more vividly in the face of, so as he stands against and compares himself to or describes why he's affectionate toward at that or if we can use the word affection, what he sees in her, it's, it's a much more vivid picture in contrast to her. Is it fair to say, and I'll, I'll ask you this question, it's naive perhaps, but w w the other modernist writers be more concerned with each character kind of as an isolated, almost alienated being, not so much in relationship to the other characters? Or am I, I'm probably well, I, I, no, I don't think so. I mean, if we think of something like Kafka's Metamorphosis, mm -hmm. that is the extreme of alienation. Mm -hmm. When Gregor wakes, wakes up and he's a, 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 a venomous mm -hmm. insect, that is the extreme of somebody being alone and alienated. Forster's characters are not so much alienated. They, they might be alienated from their true selves, I mean, it's a good Freudian notion that what you repress comes back mm -hmm. uh, to haunt you. And Henry's a repressed, passionate man that, who represses those things. Right. Um, um, oh, again, I, I lost my train thinking, of thought. But if I was thinking, on the contrary, that his are less so, and that, that he really uh, works hard to put characters in relationship, whereas other modernist writers are, Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't, don't think don't, so. Don't I think it. somebody like a Kafka is showing us the horror when you're not connected yeah. up and when your family you know, rejects you. Um, I think other modern writers perfectly well show people connecting up and having affection for each other. This is what I wanted to say that I forgot. I think that what we find in this book more than alienation is loneliness. Mm. And I think that's what brings both Margaret to Henry and Henry to Margaret. They are lonely. But it, it still is a failure of connection because she's never going to get Henry to recognize things. Well, and he kept one very important, uh, very, very important truth from her, so that's a, that would have been a, well, a deep connection. Uh, yeah, um, it's funny because connected. he says to her at some point that, he says to Margaret, that he's a scrupulous man. But if we could count on, on the fingers of two hands all the ways that he deceives yeah. people in the book, there are many of them. And as you read and reread, you find more and more things, areas where he's deceived people. Let's get to this business of flat characters and round characters, shall we? In aspects of the novel, Forrester divides characters into flat and round. Uh, he says flat characters are very useful since they never need reintroducing, mm -hmm. never run away, and have not, uh, have not to be watched for development. Yeah. They provide their own atmosphere, uh, so, so they're cardboard cutouts and uh, good, good props. Do you find the flat characters in Howard's End, do you find them? And if so, how do they function in the text? Well, I, I want to refer to Joanne's uh, point, because Joanne 
I happen to print this off. She, sure. she found for us several flat characters. Uh, and anybody who's plugged in here, I guess, tonight can see what Joanne said themselves, well, correct? Well, we can, and I can read it if, uh, is it available? Or yeah, or? Uh, here, here it is. The, the flat figure, says Joanne, are Tibby and Mrs. Munt for the Schlegels, Evie and Dolly for the Wilcoxes, and Lively Jackie for both families and Leonard Bass. And she goes on to say the function that they serve. I, I understand totally why Joanne calls them all flat characters, but I have a different feeling about them. I think there's only one truly flat character in this novel, even if Forster meant for all the ones that Joanne named to be considered flat. The truly flat character I see is Mrs. Munt. She is in there for a certain purpose. She's gossipy. She's meddlesome. She's funny. She creates muddles, a favorite Forster word, muddles. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, she doesn't have much function other than that. Oh, yes, I mean, she ties certain things up, but her attitude toward foreign things, capital F, capital T, she's just plain old funny, and she doesn't grow. But the other characters, maybe because they're so connected to the Forster's most important themes, like the importance of connecting, having personal relations, or the importance of not using people for your ends. These are themes that are so important to him that I think all these other characters tend to one degree or another toward roundness. And it's, if you read, if you look at um, Dolly, let's just take Dolly. I don't think it's an accident that most of the characters, all of the characters that Joanne named, their names end in E. Dolly, Jackie, Tibby, mm -hmm. Mrs. Munt's name is Julie. Right. Okay, uh, they all seem in some way infantilized. And in the case of Dolly, whose name is really Dorothea, but she's called Dolly, her nickname says something about how she's treated oh, as sure. a Dolly, sure. as a possession. It, yeah, she's a little it's... Dolly. Nobody ever wants mm -hmm. to listen to her. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she's the one who usually wants to say things, but they don't, they don't let her talk. They tell her she's ridiculous. I know she is in some sense a flat character, but I relate to this. I, I see a tendency toward roundness. There's a story behind Dolly. What tells you that? Is there anything in the technique that tips that for you and shows you the potential of growth? Well, she's so important to the story. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Munt is not really all that important to the grand themes mm -hmm. of the novel. But, but Dolly is. She's, not, oh, she's a woman who's kept infantilized. The man-woman question, Margaret is too liberated to be infantilized, and the only nickname she's ever called is Meg, no E at the end. Nobody calls her Maggie. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm too, making too much of that, but that's how it strikes me. Dolly is a representative, if you will, yeah. of a great theme in the novel, the relation between men and women and how men can wish to keep women in a frame, in their place. And I don't think it's an accident that the frame in which Dolly's wedding picture resides is broken, and a few chapters earlier, the frame in which Jackie's picture is kept is broken. Forster is very consciously creating rhythm in his novel, like Beethoven's Fifth, mm -hmm. which he uses as a central yeah. metaphor. Uh, these are motifs, themes and motifs. So that's why I say, and even Tibby. Tibby, you might say, oh, Tibby, we can character, we can sum up Tibby easily. He only likes to eat. He's always has hay fever. Yeah. Here again, hay fever is kind of a moral touchstone for Forster's characters. Maybe that's why some people think it doesn't tend to greatness, this book, because it's kind of obvious. If you can relate to grass and what grass becomes, mm -hmm. hay, then you're a good character. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you get hay fever and you sneeze a lot, then you're weak, you're deficient. Yeah. He tells us that in the, the first letter. So uh, you could say, well, Tib Tibby's a flat character. But really, I, we don't have time to read those pages, but I'm just going to say what those pages are. If the readers will look at this series of pages, pages 213 and 214, 216 and 217, 238 and 265, you can see that the author I think Forster wasn't sure he, he, that he kept, almost in spite of himself, wanting to make more of Tibby than Tibby, mm. than Tibby really is. So 
Tibby, first of all, he goes to Oxford, and uh, Forster was a Cambridge man, so that's also a kind of an, something about his deficiency that he goes to Oxford <laughs> and not <laughs> Cambridge. But on page 265, Tibby recognizes something about himself. He has a moment of self-revelation that he had betrayed his sister. And this book is all about betrayal. Mm. So there, and those themes that you talked about and the technique, I'd like to stick with that a little bit, this, these recurring themes, the, um, the, the place itself, keys keep coming up, as you mentioned. We, we talked about that before we began this evening. Um, and his reference early on to Beethoven's Fifth, the, the idea that he wants you to be thinking about this very formulaic music, but, but ingenious music. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's not any, any the less for it. Um, to hear those rhythms and to find those rhythms in the book. So I don't think he'd want us to use the adjective formulaic. Yeah. We, we're entitled to find it that way because, you know, the book, The Umbilicus, is cut and we can read it any way we wish. He, would, he thinks in his chapter on pattern and rhythm in aspects of the novel, he, he doesn't like books that are overly patterned, but right. he, he, he likes rhythm. So certain motifs that appear and reappear, and I think that goblin that we heard in Beethoven's Fifth, the Goblin Footfalls. And why is Beethoven's Fifth great? Because even though it ends on a heroic note, Beethoven knew that the goblins could come back at mm. any time. And I think that what's, that's what Forrester's doing at the very end when he has Margaret hear this, this terrible, terrible revelation about her husband's, be another betrayal of, her, of uh, Henry Wilcox of Ruth Wilcox, and also at the same time of Margaret oh, Wilcox. Uh, that's the goblin footfall reappearing. I, Joanne has a follow-up. She wants to know if you have any input uh, into why, why would these characters be labeled flat? Why would they why, be labeled? Why, yeah, who was it that, that, that calls them flat? Because Forrester himself talks about flat characters. Yeah, he doesn't. Characters. He's not talking about his own works, though. Right. He's not talking. He's just telling us what flat characters are. For instance, in, in Dickens, you might have characters who, who just they have a tagline and they're usually comedic, mm -hmm. and they you know they lighten the atmosphere and so forth. He wasn't referring to his own. I just wanted to know if right. our readers thought there were flat characters in this book, and I I think. For me, it's a mark of Forster's greatness that even characters we might consider flat are not, are not cardboard. They, ha they have lives that are just a little bit beyond the reach. Should we move on to our, our next question? We'll talk a little bit about this and, re and return to some of these themes as well. And of course, at any point, if you want to go back and revisit one of the questions we've already taken, we'd be happy to read that for you and bring that into the conversation. But at the moment, we can move on and talk about this business of sexual politics, what Kate Millett called sexual politics, has often been ter termed the woman question, central topic in Howard's End. Do you think Forrester is expressing his views about what it means or should mean to be a man, to be a woman, and how the two sexes relate to each other? I think this is actually a very complicated question and, and can't be answered glibly. I'll just say that uh, from his own personal circumstances, as a homosexual man who, could not, who, who wrote a, a homosexual novel in 1913-14, and it would not be published until after his death, a man who, uh, who wrote a homosexual novel and had Oscar Wilde's imprisonment very much in his mind, uh, this was not a liberated times, mm -hmm. 1914 who was also considered to be, uh, to look effeminate. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Well, I, uh, sure. let, me, let me interject. Yeah. I know sometimes when I interject, then I lose my train of thought, and I have to say to you, what was I talking about? I do that in my teaching, too. But um, this cover is a wonderful Roger Fry portrait. Roger Fry, of course, of Bloomsbury, Bloomsburyan, did this portrait of E.M. Forster. And Forster says funny things about this portrait which I won't read to you, but it hung in his drawing room for many years until the day when a visitor, and he lived with his mother until she died in, in 1945, until one day when a visitor looking at the portrait said, oh my, said to his mother, oh my, is your son queer? At that moment, that portrait came down off the wall. So um, 
I think the issue of sexuality, human sexuality, relations between men and women, uh, sexual politics, what does it mean to be a man, what does it mean to be a woman, is very complicated with Forster. Let's just take Tibby for a moment. We're told on many occasions that he is effeminate, even if that word directly isn't used. I think it is used. Um, uh, and, and, or, or they say, well, it would take somebody like Henry Wilcox to make him manly. Mm -hmm. There, I think if, these, are, these are interesting questions also for us today. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? If you see the movie and you see what the women were wearing, you're reminded that in 1908, when he started this novel, women were very corseted. Mm -hmm. And in this book, they're corseted metaphorically, look at Dolly, and they're corseted literally. Um, Henry's attitudes toward his wife, the attitudes toward the vote. Women didn't have the vote then. Um, does Forster come, Forster come down on the side of what it should mean to be a man and what it should mean to be a woman? I can only say that it seems to us that Margaret is his hero. Mm -hmm. and that uh, even at the end of the book, Helen tells her that. You are the hero. You manage to connect, as it were. Um, because he has a female protagonist who is liberated, even though she adopts ways of the harem, Forster calls those ways of the harem. So I think, I think he's giving the subject to us in all its richness and not necessarily coming to absolutely firm conclusions about whether women should have the vote or not, what are women's rights. But he does show us subjugated women, like Jackie who was a prostitute right. or, a, or a, I don't know what to call her, whether to call her a prostitute or a courtesan or a mistress. You know, they use the word mistress mm -hmm. in this book, right. but really she probably was a prostitute. Right. But we feel for her. Um, well, and Tibby was raised by, is, is raised by two women, right? I mean, it's, as it's, Forster was raised by yeah. women, but I, I don't know that that, um, yeah, he was. Well, go back to the thought you had about Tibby as someone who's, who's struggling to, to be, have a bigger role in this, struggling against perhaps Forrester himself, who essentially <laughs> won't let Tibby out. I, mean, I like wanna... that. I like the way you phrase that, because I think that's true, that characters sometimes struggle against their authors. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's the sense I got from your, your interpretation. I hadn't felt that until you said it, but it, I recast you know, my reading, and you're right, and here's a character who's trying to emerge in what was, what was Forrester having to repress to, to make do in that society that wouldn't have him as he was. Um, Tibby, I get the feeling, is kind of asocial mm -hmm. and asexual. I don't necessarily think of Tibby as homosexual. Freely, re actually, it isn't relevant to the book though it may be relevant to our psychoanalyzing yeah. of the book. Yeah. But the whole issue of male-female relations, it's, I bet it infuriated some of our readers, how Margaret gives up some of the things she loves and gives up some of her ways to be more compliant of a wife. Uh, we're going to get to that. Did we, did we get to Joanne's question? I, I, I don't know if we About did. Um, which one? Is there a new one? That was the same one. Uh, yeah. Because I'm a little confused. There's, there seems to be a question about uh, getting to a question submitted if there's time. And I don't know which question was submitted that we haven't answered. I've read two of them. So if there are any more, I'd be happy to, to do those two. Um, and because I'm not quite sure what it is. But it looks like we have a question from Joanne about getting to her question. And I don't know which one that is. We've done two, have we not? So I'm happy to do that if I've missed one. Um, Male, female, Howard's end, we're talking about. Huh? Well, and the anxiety that he may be trying to report on in a way. Uh, so if he doesn't have the answer, he's noticing that men are becoming anxious about their role. And so, so now we're seeing women, yes, corseted, exaggerated in their femininity, so men can be exaggerated in theirs because their role is changing. It's the industrial age. It's not so clear what it is to be a man when machines are doing a lot of what men Oh, machines. Do. You, you use the M word. Is that an, <laughs> another important yeah. word well. in this book? The motor car. I know I'm switching the topic. Well, you're not because I believe it's one of the things that threatened masculinity back then or made men anxious about what it means to be a man what, if machines are doing what we do. But here's do. the thing about the motor car. Yeah. I don't want to say that today. It's, it's the same thing today because I don't want to make any of the men mad. But uh, in this book, anyway, 
The motor car is very important to the Wilcox men. It's their, a symbol of their power. Mm -hmm. You know, the motor car was fairly new here. Sure, and um, interestingly, the motor car is more alive than um, some of the people in this book. We're told that in the drawing room in one of the Wilcox homes, it looked as if the motor car had spawned because mm. we have a maroon mm. leather, we have maroon leather furniture. Uh, I, we're told mm. the motor car observes Dolly and Charles on, in the drive. It's observing them. Wow. So the mm -hmm. motor car lives. The machine age was very frightening, mm. not only to, um, to Forrester, but to Lawrence, and that's one of the things that, that connects them. This, this fear of the machine, the airplane. I said I wouldn't read what he said about this, but he does say, when this was painted, it looks like he's, it says, I'm splayed on the couch as if an airplane had dropped me from the sky. And at another point, he says that he's very afraid of the airplane. This was in 1908 when it had made a one and a half minute circuit. And he said, we're, we're entering the machine age. Petrol is going to be all over the place. We're, our, our rural environment is going to be stinking. And it's interesting because the word stinking is used applying yeah. to the car here. Um, another question or observation, page 283, uh, and this is the quote now. He, Henry, has refused to connect on the clearest issue uh -huh. that can be laid before a man, and their yes. love must Take the consequences. What, what is the issue? Well, uh, I read that question from Joanne because she posted it before we began. And it relates to an earlier uh, passage when Margaret re berates him. Um, it's when Helen wants to stay in the house. This is on, it relates to what happens on page 262, 263. And, 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 and very snidely, Margaret says to her husband, will Helen's condition depreciate the property, <laughs> speaking his language? Right. And he still doesn't get it. A whole page continues with him not getting it. And she's trying to hammer it home. Doesn't he see that what he has done um, is the same thing as what she did. Mm -hmm. Helen did have a relationship that was outside of marriage, but he won't have to pay the price because he's a man, but she will. Mm -hmm. And then the, mm -hmm. the, the, the she, Margaret really lays into him, lets him have it on page 263. And this is what he refuses to see. All those things mm -hmm. she says to him on page 263, you shall see the connection. If it kills you, Henry, you have had a mistress. I forgave you. My mm -hmm. sister has a lover. You drive her from the home. Do you see the connection? Mm -hmm. Stupid, hypocritical, cruel. Oh, we love it. We just <laughs> love it that she is laying into him all those scenes of meekness when he calls and she comes. And now yeah. you know, she says, oh, contemptible. And it goes on and on. But he still doesn't see. At the bottom of the page, he says, I perceive you are attempting blackmail. <laughs> My God, that man is stupid. She was not attempting blackmail. He puts everything in terms of, let's just call it money, because blackmail right. often right. entails you know, payment. And that she can't forgive him that. Well, and he's saying, what, what, what would it take to buy you off? How much would it take to shut you up right now? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, really. No so I think that yeah, I amazing. wanted to say to thought. Joanne, what I think that thought. remark is referring to this lack of connection. Oh, wow. He's just too closed in. He's mm -hmm. built a fortress. Mm -hmm. And you know, with Forster, well, a, favorite, a favorite theme is opening out, a room with a view. Mm -hmm. That's a favorite theme of his. Um, and Henry is the opposite of a room mm -hmm. opening out. He has many rooms. He owns many <laughs> rooms, but he has no home. And he seems not to have access to them. In he, his own room. He, he doesn't have, he doesn't, because in terms of this novel, he doesn't have the key. Hmm. She, Margaret, mm -hmm. has the key. Uh, and uh, she can get into the, ca the house even without a key. She just pushes open the door and it opens because Howard's end belongs to her spiritually. And of course, in a larger sense, the, the book, and, and everybody says this, I'm not saying anything original. Howard's end is not only about a particular house but about the condition of England and the future of England. And, you know, it's, it's, it's our choice. And Dolly says, ha, 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 Howard's end. Howard's ended. But really, I think the title, that's another reason why I think Dolly is more than a flat character, because Forster has her voice some very important things that nobody wants to listen to. Really, the word end can mean something different. 
not the closing down, but the opening up yeah. into a goal. What is your end in life? What should our end be as humans? Our goal. Yeah. And, and I read it that way, too. And so at the end of the book, they come together at, at Howard's End. But it's not a book with a happy ending. Mm. Well, there were a lot of possibilities anyway, but not necessarily happy. That's right. It's not facile, let's put it that way. So what about this business of, of connection, which we've talked about over and over again? It's a big theme. It's the most important. We open up with the idea that but, but the motto, only connect. And so the question is, our last question, what does only mean? Well, I, I have to just tell you something funny. I read in the New Yorker this uh, article about Arianna Huffington. And it says, it's a measure of Huffington's standing that even Republicans feel obliged to curry her favor. She clearly relishes her role as an essential conduit of gossip and ideas. When I asked her to name her favorite book, she mentioned the epigraph to Howard's End and said, I remember the E.M. Forster line about Only Connect being a big aha moment. Well, I say aha to her because Mrs. Munt is the character in this book who likes to connect in, in terms of gossip find out what what's everybody is doing. But um, that's not what Howard's End is really about. It's not that kind of connection on a superficial level. I don't want to do an injustice to this quotation mm -hmm. from Arianna Huffington, because she also said she wants to connect ideas. Um, only connect could mean two things uh, to me, or maybe more. Only connect. If you only connect, mm. then you will live a satisfied life. Or only connect or else we're doomed. Mm. Or, um, you know, it can mean that's the sole thing you can do, or it's just the thing you need to do. You know, only connect. That's just the thing you must do. There are probably other interpretations of that. But he thought it was an important enough motto that he gave it to us as a tagline for his novel. I said it's didactic. <laughs> it's about as didactic a novel as you could read. And yet cryptic, because there are so many ways to, to interpret that. Uh, only being souls, and if, if we've got, if we see a connection as being together and only being apart, that's a wonderful gesture. And it's not facile again. It's yeah. not sit yeah, around the table, hold hands, yeah, and right. sing kumbaya. kumbaya. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. It's difficult to connect. It's tenuous. We have to keep working at it. Mm. But Margaret does connect with people because she's willing to take them on their own terms. Let's take Mary, uh, Moyo's observation. I begin the novel, I believe, I think the novel. Uh, it has a happy ending. I think it just lost part. Ends happily, relatively. If we're talking about people connecting, Henry comes around seeing things Margaret's way when she refused to give him and he and chooses her pregnant sister over her marriage. When Henry learns his son Charles will go to jail for manslaughter, he begins to see clearly. He listens to Meg. This is uh, Moyo's observation. Uh, listens to Meg and connects with everyone around him, especially with Helen. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can agree why our, our, our reader uh, thinks that. I don't agree totally with it. I think Henry is a broken man at the end. Basically, he says to her, I have no place to go. Mm -hmm. My son is in jail. It looks bad. He doesn't say that, but he's very concerned with what people think. He basically says to her, take me in. Take mm -hmm. me in your hands. Uh, so, And does he understand everything at the end? When after Margaret was silent, something shook her life in its inmost recesses. When she finds out about that note that mm. Mrs. the first Mrs. Flick, yeah. I didn't do wrong, did I? He asked, <laughs> bending down. You didn't, darling. Nothing has been done wrong. And yes, it, it, so. But he's lurching toward connection. He's asking. Well, he, you, you know, she, when she married him, she thought she could. Reform uh, him. Reform you know, him. you know, Ann Landers <laughs> always said, you're never right. getting married for that reason. Um, maybe she can. If there's a sequel to this, if there's life after yeah. Howard's End, you know, daughter of Howard's End. Uh, but we don't have a sequel. Like Lawrence, Forrester ends his novel with a tenuous affirmation. And I think at best it's tenuous. Yes, it's happy, infectious infectious joy, we're told. Mm -hmm. But whether that infection is going to hit, um, uh, whether it hits Henry, I'm not sure. But I agree now, OK, here mm -hmm. they are at last, exclaimed Henry, disengaging himself with a smile. So maybe our maybe. reader is correct. Lots of Maybe there's a lot in that smile. Interestingly, Forster was called a Cheshire cat. Now there's that smile lingering after the novel ends. 
like the Cheshire Cat. Much case. more complex and textured than maybe his uh, critics gave him credit for. Yeah. Judith Ruderman, thank you. Thank you. I wonderful. enjoyed it. Uh, and, and I enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. Judith Ruderman is a PhD at Duke, currently Vice Provost for Academic and Administrative Services here. And uh, a couple of announcements for those with an appetite to be wedded, uh, this, whose appetites have been wedded. The Bloomsbury Group uh, and our discussion about the Bloomsbury Group, you can go to www.bloomsburyatduke.com and learn more about Duke in depth. Uh, it's a weekend scheduled for February 27th through the 29th. 2009, and this weekend that I just referred to will be the culmination of a year-long program involving world-renowned speakers, a library exhibit, and a performance of Virginia Woolf's The Waves. Now, next Duke Reads session on January 14th, 2009, Reynolds Price will be here to discuss Out of Africa by Isaac Dennison. Uh, please send your comments and questions in advance, and we'll be happy to entertain them. And thank you so very much. Good night.